All right, we are at the point where we are going to execute a more exact approach to calculating the reactions. And we're going to use the flexibility method, also known as the force method, also known as the method of consistent deformations. It's all the same kind of thing. Why do we have to do all this additional complex work? Well, it's all because, take a look at the number of reactions we have. At A, we got two possible reactions. At B, just one. C, at one, that's a total of four. And then equilibrium-wise, well, we're in 2D, so we have three equations of equilibrium, and we don't have any special conditions such as hinges or anything else that specify that some sort of internal force value has to be a particular value or a particular relationship. So, in other words, we have four unknowns, we have three equations of equilibrium, that's what we call statically indeterminate to the first degree. Now, a lot of you will say, well, that's kind of goofy. I don't get that because if I go look at the horizontal reaction at A, I know it's zero. So therefore, I don't have R equal 4. I have R equal to 3. That's statically determinant. Well, sounds really clever, but it's not because then someone comes back and says to you, prove it that AX is zero. And you're like, it's obviously zero. It's trivial. And you say, okay, but what equation would you write to prove it? And you're like, well, what are you talking about? I mean, sum of forces in the x equals zero, and it's not just ax, it equals zero. It's like, aha, yes, you had to use one of these equations to prove that ax equals zero. So if you wanted to play that game that, hey, I know ax equals zero, that's fine, but you've just taken your available equations of equilibrium down by one, so then that would become three compared to two. You're still at statically indeterminate to the first degree. You cannot find all of these reaction components using only the static equations of equilibrium. Okay, So it's statically indeterminate to the first degree. And now we've got to address this um, with something more complex than just simple equilibrium equations. And the way we do that, remember, is by taking one of those reaction components away. Right? So, Oh, because we're statically indeterminate to the first degree, if we get rid of one, then we have a determinate system. So that's what we're going to do. This whole system will get rid of one of these reactions. I chose BY, and then allow the system to respond to these loads, the actual loads, let it deflect, and then we're going to push it back into place such that when we superpose or add these two together, we're going to end up back in the original condition. In the original condition, that displacement at B was equal to zero. Now you'll note that I rewrote that as delta 1 as opposed to delta B. It, you know, if you're only dealing with one degree indeterminate systems, you don't need this additional uh, nomenclature that I'm introducing here. But if we have two, three, four redundant reactions, we're going to need that additional numerical notation and using the numbers is easier ultimately to execute than the, the letters. You'll see this later on in more complex models. Here though I'm going to do it just to introduce it, we don't have to, but note what this means here. Delta B is equal to zero, that becomes delta 1 equals zero in the original one. Right Now this deflection that happens after we remove the redundant reaction and apply the actual load, that's called the primary structure with the primary displacements, as in the displacements due to the actual loads. We call that delta 1, 0. 1 for the location that we're at, the redundant reaction location. We call that a degree of freedom. And then, and that also has a direction to it, up in this case. And so delta 1, 0 would say we don't have any redundant reaction that is there. Now, because of what I showed up here above, and that's the positive direction, in reality, delta 1, 0 will be a negative value when we finally get done with this. Right? And then down here, in this case, I don't know how much By is, but it's a lot easier oftentimes to impose a known force value, and the convenient force value is a value of 1. So when we have that special unit load on there, then we calculate this displacement that's happening here. We call that a flexibility coefficient, F11. It's the displacement at degree of freedom 1 caused by a unit load being applied at degree of freedom 1 in this case. And that's how we start working with the multiple redundant reactions. We'd have displacements at degree of freedom 2 caused by the unit load at 1, um, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the more complex problem.
right? Of course, the reality is, is the reaction is not a value of one, it's some unknown value. So we can scale up or down this whole system by this unknown value by. In fact, that's what we're trying to calculate, is this value of by, right? So let's go back again, big picture. <clears throat> we're going to take the real system, and it's so much fun to work with this that we're going to break it apart into two simpler cases, two statically determinate situations, get rid of that reaction, allow the loads to displace the structure, and then we're going to put that um, reaction back into it, and we're going to en end up adding the displacements in each of those systems as the compatibility equation where the unknown reaction is going to be our unknown, and that's what we're going to actually solve for. Right? And that's what we'll execute in the next steps.